Hi, and welcome again to my videos for Physical Chemistry 2. Over the last few videos, we've learned some of the fundamental features of quantum mechanics, and we're now ready to combine those concepts with some basic ideas from mathematics to gain a deeper understanding of the very nature of matter and how it behaves. Eventually, we'll be able to use the basic ideas we've learned so far to explain why atoms and molecules form bonds, why they have the energies they do, and why the orbitals of atoms have their unusual shapes, and much, much more. To get there, we'll need to build up our mathematical model of matter over the next several videos. We'll start today by finally looking at wave functions and how they behave. Once we understand that, we can look at the wave functions of specific systems, starting with the single electron and eventually building up to atoms and molecules. So we'll start today by looking at the behavior of wave equations in general. You might recall that a wave function is described by a wave equation. You're probably very familiar with waves thanks to physics and trigonometry courses you've had before. If so, when you hear about wave equations, you probably think of simple equations like y equals sine x. However, equations like that describe a particular type of wave called a stationary wave. However, real waves in nature aren't usually stationary waves. Any particular point along the axis changes its amplitude with time because the wave travels through space. That means the wave equation we use for a wave function must have more than just one variable, not just x, but also time. We call such a wave a moving wave. And in order to determine the wave equation for a moving wave, we need to use calculus. Here's how we do it. Suppose we have a moving wave in a region of space between these two points. If you take a course in differential equations, you'll find out that the generic equation for a moving wave is this. What's this equation telling us? Well, u is the variable we use for the height of the wave. And the parentheses after the u tells us that u depends on the position along the x-axis and the time. In other words, the height of the wave at any given point along the x-axis changes over time, which is exactly what we expect for a moving wave. On the left side of the equation, we have the second derivative of u with respect to x. And on the right side, we have the second derivative of u with respect to time. We also have 1 over v squared, where v is the velocity at which the wave travels along the axis. We'll assume that that velocity is constant. In order to make this equation useful, we need to rewrite it so that the two variables are on opposite sides of the equation. In other words, we need to get x on one side of the equation and t on the other side. However, the function u contains both x and t. Usually what we do at this point is write out the function u and see if we can factor x or t out of it. But unfortunately, we can't do that in this case because we don't know what the function u is. Every different wave you can imagine will have a different expression for u, so there's no way for us to write a specific equation for it. This is a problem that we encounter very frequently in physics and chemistry. We want to write a generic equation for a phenomenon like a wave, but since it's a generic equation, we often can't write a specific formula for the functions in the equation. But that doesn't mean we're stuck. Instead, we can solve an equation like this if we make one big assumption. The assumption is that it must be possible to rewrite the function u as the product of two smaller functions, capital X and capital T. The function x only contains the variable x and doesn't contain any t's, while the function t only contains the variable t and no x's. That might seem like a big assumption, but it's not as crazy as it sounds. There are many natural phenomena that are described by equations that are essentially the result of two functions multiplied together, one depending on position and one depending on time. Wave functions, like the ones that we're interested in, also have that property. So assuming that we can rewrite the function u as a product of functions x and t is a pretty safe bet. Now that we've written the function this way, our job becomes a lot easier. The next step is to get all the appearances of the variable x on the left side and all the appearances of t on the other side. 
This is a procedure called the separation of variables, and we'll need to use it very often in the rest of the course. To do it, notice that the derivative on the left side is with respect to x. That means that when we take the derivative, we're going to treat the function t as though it were a constant, because t doesn't contain the variable x in it. So we can just take the function t out of that differential. In the same way, on the right side of the equation, the function x is treated like a constant in the derivative it appears in, so we can pull it out of that differential. That leaves us with this equation. Now we can divide both sides by both the function x and the function t. When we do that, here's what we get. But we just achieved a fairly important result. Notice that the left side of the equation now contains only the variable x. There are no t's on that side of the equation. And on the right side, there are only t's and no x's. So our separation of variables has been accomplished. We've got all the x's on the left and all the t's on the right. So why was that an important thing to do? Well, eventually, we want to solve this differential equation. In order for an equation to be practical, we don't want any differentials in it. But solving a differential equation is extremely difficult if the variables haven't been separated first. So how do we go about solving this equation now that the variables are separated? Well, let's think about how these equations relate to a real moving wave. Suppose this is a snapshot of our wave at a particular moment in time. And the equation we have is the equation that describes the wave. Now, suppose we calculate the value of the left side of the equation at a particular value of x. And now we vary x and perform the calculation again. When we do so, the value of little x, of course, changes. However, we're still frozen at the same instant in time. Remember, we've taken a snapshot of the wave at a particular moment, so we're not altering t when we alter x. Since t isn't changing, that means the right side of this equation hasn't changed, because t is the only variable on the right side. So that means that even though we changed x, the right side of the equation is a constant. Let's call that constant k. So even though we're changing the value of x, overall, the left side of the equation is always going to be equal to the same number, the constant k. Now, let's imagine that instead of freezing the variable t and moving x back and forth, we instead freeze the variable x and run t back and forth. In other words, we'll pick a single value of x and watch how the height of the wave changes at that point as we run time backward and forward. When we do, the value of little t changes, but the value of x doesn't. But since x isn't changing, that means the left side of the equation must not change, because x is the only variable on that side of the equation. That means that the left side of the equation is a constant. But think about that. We know that the left and right sides of the equation are equal to each other, and we already saw that the right side is equal to the constant k. So the left side must also be equal to the constant k. So now we have these two equations. One equation contains only the variable x, and the other one contains only the variable t. It turns out that we'll be able to solve both of these equations, and that'll finally allow us to have a solution to our wave equation, something that doesn't contain any derivatives. To do it, let's start by simplifying these equations a little. First, we'll get rid of the fraction in each equation by multiplying both sides of the first equation by capital X, and both sides of the second equation by v squared times capital T. Next, we'll move the term containing the constant k to the left side in each of the equations. And finally, let's define a constant called beta, such that k 
is equal to negative beta squared. If we plug that into our equations, here's what we get. That last step might have seemed unexpected and maybe unnecessary. It seems like all we did was substitute one constant, beta, for another one, k. Why did we do that? Actually, there's a good reason. Writing the equations the way we have them now puts them in a form that has a very well-known solution, which you'll probably learn about if you take a course in differential equations. It turns out that differential equations that have this form have this solution. In this expression, there's a function capital Z that has as its variable little z. Meanwhile, n is a constant. If you compare this to our equations, you can see that both of our equations have exactly this format, so we'll be able to come up with a solution to both of them. Let's look at the equation involving x first. If you compare this equation to the generic solved differential equation, you can see that the solution to our equation will be the function x equals a cosine of beta x plus b sine of beta x. So now we have a solution to that differential equation. It no longer contains any differentials, which means that it's almost in a form that we can use. The only problem is that it contains three constants, a, b, and beta, that we don't know the values of, but we'll be able to take care of that next. To find the values of those constants, we just need to use the one piece of information that we haven't used yet. You might recall that when we first started looking at this wave, we said that it's confined to a certain region of space. Let's say that the left side of that space is the coordinate zero. The space can have any width. It might be microscopic, or it could be light years in length. Let's just say that it has an arbitrary length, and we'll call that length little a. So, the wave starts at position 0 and ends at position A. We imagine that the wave is tied down at the two ends, so that at position 0, the wave has a height of 0. And at position A, it also has a height of 0. These are known as boundary conditions, and they're the key to finding the values of the constants in our equation. For example, consider what this equation is like when x is equal to 0. When x is 0, that means that the right side of the equation is a times the cosine of 0 plus b times the sine of 0. Since cosine 0 is 1 and sine 0 is equal to 0, that means that the right side of the equation is just capital A. Meanwhile, the boundary condition tells us that the function x is equal to 0 at this point. So, our overall equation becomes 0 equals a. So, now we know the value of a. a is 0, so the first term of the equation drops out, and we just have capital X equals b times the sine of beta x. Now let's use the other boundary condition. We'll plug in little a for the value of x, and we know that the function x equals 0 at this point, which gives us this. Let's think about this equation for a second. We know that the right side of the equation must be equal to 0. In order for that to happen, either b must be equal to 0, the sine term must be equal to 0, or both. But if b were equal to 0, that would mean that the right side of the equation is always just 0. But that would mean that the height of the wave is zero everywhere. Basically, it would mean that the wave is flat. But that wouldn't be much of a wave. Since we need the wave to be non-zero at least sometimes, we need b to be equal to something other than zero. So that means it must be the sine term that's equal to zero. If you've taken a trigonometry class, you know that the sine of z is equal to zero when z is pi, two pi, 3 pi, and so on. So that means beta times a must be a multiple of pi. So beta is equal to an integer, n, times pi over a. 
Now, let's review what we've done so far. We had this equation for a generic moving wave. It had three constants in it, a, b, and beta. By applying the boundary conditions on the wave, we figured out what two of these constants are. We found out that a is equal to zero, and beta is n times pi over a, where n is a positive integer. That gives us this for our generic equation for a wave. Now we only need to determine the value of the constant b. But before we do that, let's look at the second wave equation we have. You might recall that when we performed the separation of variables procedure, we ended up with two equations. One involved only the position, and that's the one we've been working with so far, and the other involved only time. Let's now work on solving that second equation. This one has the same format as the equation involving position, so we solve it in the same way. When we do, the solution has the same basic form. We have a cosine and a sine term added together, each term multiplied by a constant. However, this time there are two different constants, so instead of a and b, we call them c and d. And this time we don't have boundary conditions like we did for the first equation. For the first equation, we knew that the height of the wave had to be zero at the two extreme ends of the wave's position. But there aren't any rules for the value the wave must have at specific times. For that reason, we can't use boundary conditions to determine the values of c and d. However, we do already know the value of beta from the work that we've already done. Beta is n times pi over a, so we can plug that into our equation. It turns out that n pi v over a is called the cyclic frequency of the wave, and it has the symbol lowercase omega with a subscript n. I'll plug that into this equation, which gives us this. But unfortunately, that's as simple as we can make the equation for now. But let's see where we are in terms of the overall equation. You might recall that we decided that u, the function of our wave, could be expressed by multiplying the functions capital X and capital T together. We now have an expression for both of those functions, so let's multiply them together to get the expression for u. When we do that, here's what we get. There are three constants that we still don't know the value of, b, c, and d. We can actually reduce this to two unknown constants. Here's how. If we distribute the b into the parentheses, we'll have b times c in the first term and b times d in the second. Since b and c are both constants, that means the product bc is also a constant. Let's give it its own symbol, f. In the same way, b times d must be its own constant, which we can call g. There's one more thing to notice. As we saw earlier, the value of n is a positive integer. The overall solution to our wave equation is the sum of the expression we'd get for all the different possible values of n. In other words, the overall solution is given by this equation where the sum is over all the possible values of n from 1 to infinity. So, what does this equation mean? Well, now that we have it, we can finally plot it and get a picture of what the wave looks like. Here are the plots of the wave that we get when n equals 1, n equals 2, n equals 3, and n equals 4. Each of these is plotted at the instant of time where t is equal to zero. As time progresses, each of these waves will change and move, but for now, the most important thing to notice is that the curve where n equals one simply rises and then falls back to the axis. But when n equals two, it rises, then falls and passes through the axis so that the wave dips down below zero, and then it comes back up again. The n equals 3 wave passes through the axis two times, and the n equals 4 does it three times. 
These points, where the wave passes through the x-axis, are called nodes, and we'll soon see that they have important implications when we relate what we've learned today to wave functions. But what does all this mean? What does this equation actually tell us about moving waves, and what can we learn from it about wave functions? Well, I'll give you a sneak preview of some results we'll get in a future video. It turns out that if we plot this equation in three dimensions with appropriate boundary conditions, we get some familiar shapes depending on the values of the constants. Here are some of them. These should look very familiar to you. These are the 2px, 3px, and 4px orbitals, and the 3dx squared minus y squared, and 3dz squared orbitals that you've probably learned about in your very earliest chemistry course. As we learn more about wave functions, we'll see how this generic wave equation is connected to the shapes of the orbitals. One last thing about this equation. We saw a few minutes ago that the waves described by this equation have nodes, and the number of nodes is one fewer than the value of n, so that, for example, the wave where n equals 3 has two nodes. What happens when we write the equation so that it takes two dimensions into account instead of just one? In two dimensions, the equation looks like this. Notice that there are two terms in this part of the equation, one for the x dimension and one for the y. And also notice that there are two different summation symbols, one for the different values of m, which is the integer we'll use in the sign term for the x dimension, and the other over the different values of n, which is the integer we use for the y dimension. It'll help us get a better mental image of what wave functions are like if we try to visualize this equation. What will a plot of this equation look like? Let's start with the simplest case, where both m and n are equal to 1. As we saw for the one-dimensional wave, when the integer is 1, the wave simply rises from 0, reaches a maximum, and then returns to 0. For our two-dimensional wave, that looks like this. Now, what happens if m is 2 and n equals 1? Let's think that through. This means that along the y-axis, n is 1, so there will be no nodes. However, along the x-axis, m is 2, so there will be one node in that dimension. Here's what that looks like. If we were to look at this plot from this angle, so that we were looking at the x-axis, we'd see a node right here. However, if we looked from this angle, so that we could see the y-axis, we wouldn't see a node. Similarly, here's a plot where m is 1 and n is 3. In this case, we wouldn't see any node on the x-axis, but we'd see two nodes on the y-axis. And finally, here's a plot where both m and n are equal to 2. In this case, we would see one node on both the x and y-axis. These same ideas will apply when we talk about three-dimensional systems. For those, our waves will be able to have nodes along three different coordinates, and we'll see that this is part of what gives orbitals their distinctive shapes. It's important to remember that the reason orbitals have these shapes is because the electrons in orbitals have the properties of waves, so they're described by wave equations like the ones we've been looking at. Well, that's enough new material for now. So far, we've just been looking at general equations for moving waves. When we talk again, we'll apply this specifically to wave functions, which will finally allow us to determine the values of the constants that we haven't solved yet. And that'll finally allow us to determine the equation for a real wave function, and use it to determine properties like the energy, the position, and momentum of a system. I hope you'll join me for that. But until then, have a good week.